Welcome to the fourth episode of F-35 Lightning 2, Busting Myths. In this episode, we will be covering two myths. The first is about the history of missile use in the Vietnam War. The second is about the status of the F-35's ejection seat. Myth number 9, the F-4 Phantom performed poorly in Vietnam, until it was upgraded with a cannon. This myth relates to the F-35 specifically as a number of articles and comments online claim that history is repeating itself. With the B and C variants not having an internal gun, and the F-35 overall being designed to fight primarily with beyond visual range missiles. These individuals claim that this design choice was made previously in Vietnam with the F-4 Phantom, and that the Phantom was only able to redeem itself after they added a cannon back to its design. This is incorrect. Early in the war, F-4 Phantoms were flown by the United States Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps. These Phantoms were armed only with bombs, missiles and sometimes gun pods. These cannons were potted 20mm M61A1 Vulcans, which have modern variants used in fighters today, such as the F-22 Raptor. Unfortunately, due to the flexibility of their pylons and hard points, these cannons suffered from oscillation and vibration issues, making them inaccurate. In addition, one air-driven variant of the gun pod, the Su-16A, could not be used above speeds of 400 miles per hour, limiting its use as an air-to-air -air weapon. In combat against enemy aircraft, Phantoms initially achieved an average kill-to-loss ratio of about 2 to 1, across each of the services. While positive, this exchange ratio was simply unacceptable. When Air Force and Navy leadership looked into why Phantoms were performing poorly, a number of concerns were raised. One of these several concerns was indeed that many fighters were going up without a cannon and becoming defenseless when they ran out of missiles. To resolve the issue, the United States Air Force developed a new variant of the Phantom, the F-4E. This variant came with an internal Vulcan, at the expense of a smaller radar. The Navy however, not having the funding to replace or structurally modify their Phantoms, took a different approach and instead focused on addressing the serious flaws that were identified in pilot training. They began taking experienced pilots, and focused on trying to better use what they already had, developing better methods of using their missile armament. The Navy began running pilots through this course and at the same time, also taught its maintainers how to better care for missiles and their sensitive components, such as missile fuses and seekers. This course then went on to become known as the famous Top Gun Fighter Weapons School. As the war progressed, the Air Force's F-4s unfortunately saw little difference in their exchange ratio, with the ratio actually slightly decaying. In addition, of the air-to-air -air kills that the Air Force did make with its upgraded F-4E Phantoms, approximately three-quarters were still achieved with missiles. Even across the entirety of air-to-air -air kills made by the Air Force, across all of its platforms, two-thirds were still made by missiles. The Navy however saw great success with their kill-to-loss ratio skyrocketing from the old 2 to 1, up to an average of 13 to 1, all the while operating without cannons on their Phantoms. The program was so effective, that all but two Navy air-to-air -air kills were made by Top Gun graduates. Later, the Air Force followed suit, keeping their cannons for just in case, but otherwise overhauling how it trained its combat pilots. During Vietnam, pilots had been universally assignable, able to be transferred between bombers and fighters with little or zero conversion training. After seeing the Navy's success, this training system was abandoned. Top Gun also influenced the Air Force's decision to create Red Flag, which is today regarded as the world's most advanced air combat training exercise. And lastly, even on the other side of the war, of the approximate 250 claimed kills by pilots flying on behalf of North Vietnam, more than half were achieved with R-3S missiles. Of the approximate 120 kills that were confirmed, nearly 60% were made by missiles. And in fact, one common trend that was identified, among North Vietnamese aces in the war, was their nearly sole reliance on using missiles to attain their kills. Myth number 10, the F-35's ejection seat kills pilots. 
The F-35's ejection seat has one of the widest pilot weight and height ranges ever put into a fighter. Being designed to accommodate pilots that weigh between 103 and 245 pounds. Many previous fighters, including some today like the Super Hornet, do not accommodate pilots that weigh 136 pounds or less. In some other fighters, pilots in the lightweight range are also not permitted to fly with night vision goggles without a waiver. To date, no pilot has been killed or harmed by the F-35's ejection seat, partly because it hasn't had to be used yet. Despite this, currently there is a restriction on pilots that weigh less than 136 pounds, or 62 kilograms, from flying the F-35. So far, this has resulted in one lightweight male pilot having to change over to the F-22 Raptor. The reason that this restriction exists, is due to an issue that is a product of both the ejection seat, and the new third-generation, helmet-mounted display system. The specific threat to lightweight pilots occurs not during the initial bone-jarring ejection, but moments afterwards during low-altitude ejections, when the seat immediately drops away and the main canopy of the pilot's parachute opens. At this point in time, the pilot is flying feet first into the wind, with their legs up high and their head tilted slightly backwards. As the main canopy opens, there is a sudden deceleration, with a parachute yanking on the pilot's shoulders. As this happens, the pilot's body and head, are trying to continue along their path. This means that the head tilts back even further, until the pilot's neck is eventually broken. Driving this to an even greater extent is the momentum of the helmet, which increased from 4.7 pounds in the Gen 2 version, to 5.1 pounds in the newer Generation 3 helmet. By comparison, a JHMCS helmet, as used in newer US 4th Gen fighters, weighs 4.6 pounds. This additional weight has come from additional sensors and optics, which, while they've added weight, have significantly reduced issues relating to jitter, latency and other previous visor display issues. What this all means is that, for pilots that weigh 136 pounds or less, their neck, according to historic data and statistics, is not capable of resisting the extra inertia of the helmet, resulting in a nearly 100% chance of serious neck injury or death. In addition, for pilots that are ejecting and weigh 136 to 165 pounds, there is a 23% chance of serious neck injury or death. While having a 1 in 4 chance of being seriously injured or killed in an ejection is quite concerning, all ejections have a serious risk involved. In the U.S. Armed Forces, since 1995, approximately one in every eight ejections has resulted in serious injury or death. The only reason that a pilot ever chooses to eject is when they believe the only alternative is certain death. Despite this, the F-35 Joint Program Office is working on three separate solutions to reduce the risks associated with ejection, and allow pilots that weigh 136 pounds or less to continue to fly. The first is a fabric panel between the parachute risers. This panel will brace the pilot's head during the opening of the canopy and limit how far it can move backwards. The second fix is a timing switch, that will be toggled when a lightweight pilot enters their aircraft. This switch will slightly delay the deployment of the main canopy, allowing a lighter pilot's head and spine to come into better alignment. This delay will have no impact on the ejection seat's zero altitude, zero airspeed capability, as lighter pilots are already ejected to a greater height. The third solution, consists of modifications to the Generation 3 helmet. When a pilot is fitted for their helmet, and contrary to internet comments, they do not have the entire helmet custom made for them. Rather, their head is laser scanned and a custom foam insert is made to securely fit their head. On the outside of the helmet, there are two visors. The first is an inner visor, which is flipped down during flight and is designed to reflect the helmet display into the pilot's eyes, as well as protect the pilot's face during an ejection. During daytime, a second visor is also flipped down, which is polarized and simply allows the pilot to see better against the sun and bright reflections. 
to avoid bringing back problems with jitter and latency. The new lightweight variant of the Gen 3 helmet will retain all the same improved electronics and optics. It will however, use a lighter foam material for the insert, and it will change the use of the visor so that, like in the fourth generation aircraft it replaces, only one visor will be on the helmet at any one time and the pilot will simply swap them when their environment gets brighter or darker. This new Gen 3 light helmet has already been built, and currently weighs 4.63 pounds. It has also been undergoing ejection sled testing, with testing being successful. Some final testing is still ongoing, but these new fixes are currently scheduled to go into all new F-35s and begin being retrofitted into existing aircraft by November this year, at which point the restriction will be lifted. This has been another episode of F-35 Lightning 2, Busting Myths. For more information, including sources, view the video description.